a little bit from. And then I've got a couple of examples, of, uh, a couple of monitoring examples um, that are more detailed. One is specifically related to fire effects, um, second order of fire effects. And the second one is looking at fuels, uh, canopy bulk density specifically, and crown fire risk. And then we'll look at uh, some of the kind of second order fire effects monitoring that we're doing, which we do a lot of here, um, to look at overall ecosystem viability and if our management is moving, moving, the, moving the goal, moving the, the yard line um, toward the goal. And then we'll talk a little bit about fuels and first order fire effects questions that we have and preview the sites that, we'll, that we will see, some of the sites we'll see in June. And obviously certainly have, a, have an opportunity for questions at the, at the end. Um, so the, the Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission, as, as Amanda said at the introduction, is a non-regulatory public benefit corporation created by law. And our overall goal is to is really about pitch pine scrub oak barrens. Even though the corner blue was endangered at the time the preserve was created, at least in New York State it was endangered, there, there's no specific species mentioned anywhere in the law that created the preserve and the commission. It's all about uh, managing for a pitch pine scrub oak barrens, and the law is specific to say that the pitch pine scrub oak barrens here needs, needs, needs to burn and needs to be managed with prescribed fire. Additionally, we, we advise our regulatory member agencies and municipalities on how to balance development and conservation around the preserve. So our board, if you will, is made up of, it's chaired by the commissioner of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and co-chaired by the commissioner of the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. And those folks are appointed by the governor. It also consists of the Albany County Executive, the super town supervisors for Guildland and Colony, the mayor of the capital city of New York, Albany, uh, the state director of the Nature Conservancy, and four private citizens appointed by the governor and approved by the Senate. So that's effectively, that is who the commission is, and that's effectively who I work for. That's you know, our, our board of directors, if you will. Um, as, as you all know uh, by now, certainly northeastern pine barrens exist as this archipelago of, of habitat islands scattered across you know, an urbanizing sea of northern forest for, for all intents and purposes. And everywhere, you know, there are about 20 of these pine barrens left split between coastal and inland. All of them are, are more or less globally rare, and all of them are incredibly, all of them are fire dependent, they're pyrogenic. And they're incredibly important for biodiversity. They support some incredible um, diversity, some, incredible, some incredibly rich habit landscapes of, uh, of rare biodiversity, which also depends on fire. And the Albany pine bush is considered one of the best inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens, and it's best characterized, here's a nice growing season shot of what we think our high quality pine barrens should look like. It's kind of a savanna within a savanna where you've got an open canopy of pitch pine and a few oak trees, an open understory canopy of scrub oaks with lots of grasses and wildflowers mixed in that are typical of, of the prairie states. Um, it's S1G2. It's also the first place the Carner Blue Butterfly, um, the state and federally endangered species, was identified. So Carner, New York is a little, was a little rail station right here in Albany. And currently the preserve is 3,300 acres in size, and hopefully you can see not only the preserve, which is that blue jigsaw puzzle on the map, and you can see the interstate highways, I hope, and, uh, but also just look at the, the larger picture itself and the, the wildland urban interface um, that, that we are working within. We do not have the luxury here of managing one contiguous block of open space. It's, it's pretty challenging to, to manage this landscape with fire. And the preserve supports 75 wildlife species of greatest conservation need. That's about 20% of those rare species that are found, that are known to, to exist in New York State. And as Amanda said, it's a national natural landmark. Again, while in an urban interface, this isn't news to any of you, but the Northeast has an incredible wooey, and yet we have some really volatile and fire-dependent ecosystems like pine barrens. Our wildland or urban interface is particularly challenging, as you saw from that earlier picture, and here in this annotated picture, you can see Mount Trashmore, hopefully there on the left during this. This is a, uh, this is a June or July growing season prescribed fire in 2005. So there's shopping malls, the interstate highways, the building in the lower right-hand corner is, a, is, is an old bank that now serves as our office and discovery center. Check out the traffic in the lower right-hand corner. It's a pretty busy, it's a pretty busy area. Um, a lot, a lot going on, and a really difficult landscape to to manage because of the human the human context. And here's the, here's another view of that wildland urban interface. And here, this is a Google Earth just happened to catch um, a uh, July 2015 prescribed fire in part of the preserve. 
the 195 New Connor Road pin there is, is highlighting where our office is, and you can see kind of the smoke plume from that fire. So managing, managing with fire here is incredibly challenging. Most burn units only have one or two acceptable wind directions. The commission started using prescribed fire in 1991 for all the reasons you're likely using prescribed fire. Um, for ecological reasons, to try and improve ecosystem viability and conserve rare wildlife, manage fuels and reduce wildfire risk, but also to learn about managing, in, in this case for us, we started with the intent to learn specifically about how to manage fire and smoke in this, in this interface. And from 1991 to 1999, all of our fires were dormant season fires. This is a picture of a dormant season fire. This is the near miss that we had in 95, 94. I was on for one of my first seasons here. Um, and dorm, dormant season fires are really challenging because of the, the high fuel loads and the fuel type that we had. Um, after decades of fire suppression, we ended up with the dormant season. It's extremely volatile. You get high flame lengths and r very rapid rates of spread. Additionally, you know, I, I liken it to peeling an onion. These dormant season fires really don't do, don't meet all of the ecological objectives we have because of those rates of spread. They don't really burn down through the decades of litter and dust that have accumulated. So we transitioned, and I'll talk about how we transitioned to this in, in a minute through, by looking at our monitoring results. But using adaptive management, we, we came up with a different paradigm for putting fire on the ground here, at least in the restoration phase of things where we look at mowing and burning in a single season. We're mowing with, a, with this, this is a hydro axe from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in that photograph. But we also use, now use um, fecon mower heads on the front of, uh, of skid steers. But we mow right after things green up and then burn later that growing season. And it's really helped us tremendously in managing fuels and improving the feasibility of our prescribed fires. And really what it's done is opened up the wet end of the prescription and allowed us to use light and variable winds uh, because it's, 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 uh, it's just much, much more logistically feasible to manage those fires and manage the smoke. But ultimately our management is a combination of things. All of our management is geared specifically toward restoring altered fire regimes and improving ecosystem health. And we do that with fire alone and with these other treatments in combination or by themselves or in preparation for fire. So mowing, silviculture, herbicides, planting, and all of that you know, is really looking at improving ecosystem health and ensuring that we can manage all of these lands with prescribed fire. Since 1991, we've managed, now it's um, thanks to Tyler Briggs, skill. We're up we're just over 2,300 acres now um, in the preserve. And this rainbow map here just shows you all of the different areas and kind of the, 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 the time scale of, of the, the temporal nature of, of the burns that we've put on the landscape. Relatively big ones, relatively small ones over the, over the course of the last 24 years. And this map is really just to highlight that, at least in the restoration phase of things, we did transition to growing season fire, which has been a tremendously beneficial asset for us. But currently about half of the burns that we've done on, in the preserve are, have been growing season, the other, the other half dormant season. And ultimately, we're looking at, even in the maintenance burn, burn regime, that we would use dormant and growing season fire periodically. And additionally, we are using silviculture. This is a stand that was thin. This, is a pitch this was a closed canopy stand of pitch pine a couple different angles of it, and we are working with silviculture increasingly to try and expedite restoring barrens. And we, to date, we've managed just over 1,000 acres of the preserve with silviculture. If it's non-native invasive black locust, it's a clear cut, rip out the stumps, rip out the roots, rake it, and plant and start all over again. And um, the other, the green shading there is really more a typical silvicultural thinning, uh, typically thinning from below to, to uh, achieve a desired stand density and facilitate fire management on the ground. But you are all joined this webinar today to learn a little bit about what we have learned through our ecological monitoring. And so I wanted to kind of give you a snapshot of some of the conservation measures that we have employed and how, we, and how we've done that. And I think relative to many, our landscape is kind of small, but still we, we, we you know, even, even as, a, as a reasonably sized organization with a relatively decent budget, you can't monitor everything everywhere. So we have taken the approach of whenever we are, we are interested in investigating a new management technique, in this case, growing season mow and burn treatment, and there are other examples that, that I won't get into today, 
Um, we typically start out small scale, monitor it heavily, research it, figure out what's working, not working, and at some at, at some detail, and then simply um, if it, it once once we figure out what works, we'll then employ that in the landscape at scale. And we started out, you know, initially with our dormant season fires those first couple of years. And Tim Simmons and Dr. Patterson and others maybe on this call can, can attest to the fact that we started very small and really studied the heck out of those plots. So this is another example of that. And this is an eight-acre eight acre management unit called Alley Cat because it's in Region A. The fun part of writing a burn prescription in the pine bush is you get to name the unit. And with Alley Cat, we mowed eight acres. And if you look at the, the far left-hand side, you can get a sense of what it looked like before it was mowed. You can see the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Hydroax there mowing. And for a sense of scale, folks, that is a front-end loader that has that mower mounted on it. So you can get a sense of how tall and dense the scrub oak was prior to treatment. You can see some of the scrub oak left behind the machine. It was then burned in the growing season. And then you can see the result, the immediate aftermath of Tom Dooley's handiwork on that far right hand picture there. So we employ a number of techniques and photographs of course are a great way of monitoring um, fire effects and change over time. And here's, you can see the mowed only section of Alley Cat in the background of those four acres that were mowed and not burned. And then in the foreground here six days later, um, August 9th, you can see the area that was mowed and burned. And here is just the mode and burn section eight, 18 days later. One of the things we learned from this, even just from this photograph, and over you can't tell specifically from the photograph. Obviously, there's a lot of heat scorch on the crowns of those pitch pine. Those were fully mature pitch pine. We mowed the scrub oak right up to the base of those trees. And over the course of a couple of years, found out that we killed 50% of the 20 trees that were in this unit. They can't take that kind of heat in July. So now we've mod using, using, there's a good case of collecting some information. And now when we do this treatment for the first time, we leave basically the scrub oak unmowed within the drip line of those trees so that the root collar doesn't receive the sa that same level of fire uh, intensity and severity. And that has been really very successful for us in re dramatically reducing our pitch pine mortality in the growing season. But there's 18 days later, you can see the scrub oak coming back and the density looks much different than it did before. And here it is 37 days later and those pitch pine trees are pretty much toast. So photographs are really valuable at the broad scale, but also up close. And um, for the sake of time, I'll just point out here the two right-hand slides. Some of the things we were looking to do with our dormant season fires, where, they were, where those dormant season fires were unsuccessful, was eliminating litter and duff. So you can see even just from this photograph, pitch pine needles are what, about four inches long. The red line there is the, is the former um, surface of the litter and duff layer. And now we've, it's, you know, we've, we've removed four or five inches of, of litter and duff. And the, the pit photograph right below that, you can see that's all of that exposed sand around those scrub oak. The other thing we learned is that you can't kill scrub oak with any kind of fire. If you're looking to kill scrub oak, uh, it is the most resilient. We melted uh, a researcher from RIT, uh, Bob Cremins, his thermocouples. He, uh, you know, he couldn't tell exactly how hot that fire was because we, we destroyed his equipment. And yet, you know, the scrub oak was stunted for a couple of years, but it bounced right back. And there's a publication with some of this information in there on the bottom of that slide. But we, these, these burns definitely helped us better achieve litter and duff reduction and exposing mineral soil and expanding grassy openings. And we know that not only from photographs, but also from intense data collection and analysis that we did. So again, on the left-hand side here is the mow only. The right-hand side is one year uh, post mow and burn. And we randomly placed transects, and then along those transects, set up these one-meter quadrats. I forget how many we had, many of them, along, along this transect, and then sampled a variety of metrics within each of those, each of those sampling plots, litter and duff, um, exposed mineral soil, height of vegetation, species composition, et cetera. So again, just the photos alone tell you, do definitely tell a story between the left you have, a thicket again a year later, and on the right, that's looking a lot better, a lot more open, a lot more barren, what we, what we think we need for barrens. But the data analysis um, re revealed, revealed this as well. So this is simply a, a principal components ornination of vegetation structure within the two treatment types. And the thing to take away from this is simply that they're different. They scatter differently. You have the mow only plots in those gray circles on the upper left hand side of this, of this plot and the mow and burn plots, uh, sample, sampling units 
are on the right hand side the right hand side and the lower so they're they're within within a, within the the context of what we were measuring related to structure those two treatments were were significantly different but happy 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 to to see that from a species composition perspective they were very similar which is what we were going for we didn't want to lose any species per se and change the change the species composition but we definitely wanted to make a pretty big impact on the structural component of those stands and here's some some of what the more detailed data analysis looks like and this the most significant differences were in litter depth um, duff depth exposed mineral soil um, grass grass cover and the high veg cover and again for for us and and I'll, I'll reiterate this again when it for, for us when it comes to thinking about second order fire effects and longer term monitoring Depending on what our specific question is, we work with the staff here as well as our academic partners to try and develop and ide identify and then develop sampling regimes specific to that question. It's not that one sampling regime works across the board for everything that you might want to know about second order fire effects. It really gets down to the nitty gritty. If it's, you know, with the, in this case, we're looking at something specific. If we're looking at monitoring lupin, for example, which is the only food plant for the endangered corn blue butterfly, that's a whole separate sampling regime. So we'll go into a treat site that we've burned, and if we're looking to count lupin, that's, that's a whole different sampling regime than what we did here and what we do to look at pitch pine recruitment as, as three different examples. So it's, it really depends. Your monitoring really needs to depend on what the question is you're trying to answer. And that's the end of part one. Here's part two. Um, the second in-depth analysis uh, example that I'll, that I'll give you, and this, and this was also published, was really looking at um, crown fire risk in some of our closed canopy stands of pitch pine. And this is following up on the work of Dr. Patterson and Matt Devenick, um, his, his PhD work. And we simply employed his methods to evaluate these stands and calculate not only what is the crown fire risk under varying wind scenarios, but also look at modeling out reducing stand density to a level where the models suggest that our crown fire risk would be appreciably reduced. I will spare you all of the, the, the details behind that, but you can read it if you, if you want to in this paper. But ultimately, we came up with a scenario where we're looking at, and now it's done. You'll, you'll see it if you come to the workshop. We've thinned the 85 acres shaded in red on the right-hand side of this slide. And if you look, what I, what I want you to note with this photograph, the development immediately east of the red shaded area is townhouses, high-end condos, and, office, and an office park. So in being in the northeast, you know, our prevailing winds are west, northwest typically. So having that crown fire risk next to those, that infrastructure, we saw it as a potential problem. And given that we're the ones managing the preserve, we saw it, we we took it to be our responsibility to thin that stand before we ever end up in a scenario where a wildfire is potentially running through it. So we, here we simply employed silviculture to reduce our stand density down to about 30 trees per acre. And about, uh, well, 30, 30, square, 30 square feet of basal area per acre is what it was. The stand density is a little higher than that. And as it turns out, the serendipity of this place never ceases to amaze me. Um, southern pine beetle moving north, it turns out that thinning these pitch pine stands and using prescribed fire may hopefully help make the pine bush a little more resilient to the likely inevitable introduction of uh, the southern pine beetle into our landscape. So there are a couple of more detailed examples of how we've approached modeling, look, um, evaluating fuels and fire effects in the preserve. But generally what we're doing is really focusing on ecosystem viability and ecosystem health questions, which ultimately all relate back to our management and specifically to fire management. So here again is kind of the quintessential, what we understand now to be the highest quality pitch pine scrub oak barrens. It really is a barrens. It doesn't have a lot of trees. It's got a decent amount of shrubs and an awful lot of grasses and wildflowers and other dwarf shrubs mixed into this landscape. And, and how do we know that? We know that because we are using these rare wildlife species, which we look at and I look at as kind of being the ultimate expression of ecosystem function. If the ecosystem is functioning well, the distribution and abundance of the species that depend on that landscape the most, the, the most obligate species, should be increasing and improving over time as we continue to manage the preserve. So we use a variety of these species of greatest conservation need, not all 75, but a few of them, to look at 
the trends in ecosystem management over time, in addition to utilizing remote sensing to look at large scale um, landscape change. And I just want to walk you through a couple of, a couple of these examples. The first of which is the endangered carnivore butterfly. Um, I would show you how much lupin we had before we started burning and planting, but it wouldn't show up at this scale on this map. There were nine sites that totaled 13 acres. Now, thanks to our management, we have over 200 hectares, or about 450 acres of lupin on the landscape. And we followed that up with um, accelerating the colonization of that habitat by bringing butterflies from one part of the preserve to these newly restored habitats. And you can see our field ecologist, entomologist, Amanda Dillon, in the right side of the of the of the, the slide there with uh, butterflies to release in a, in a site that was mechanically thin, the forest was thinned, it was burned, and then we planted lupin. And it's working. So here, you know, one case, our, for our federally endangered species, the only species that we're directly managing for in the preserve, we've seen um, its numbers increase dramatically. From 2007, when we first started coming up with uh, population estimates, thanks to our uh, conservation biologist, uh, Dr. Steve Campbell, we had a few hundred in 2007. The blue bars here on this slide illustrate that the area we were surveying in increased over time as we continue to expand habitat on the landscape. And the dashed line there at 3,000 butterflies is the federal recovery threshold for our meta population of carners. And we are now well above 10,000 animals um, and well above 5,000 animals for the last four to five years in the preserve. So for all intents and purposes, we have pretty much met or exceeded the recovery thresholds for this endangered animal in, in the preserve. So that's obviously a really good sign that our management is working, but again, that management all ties back to putting fire on the ground and facilitating the stage for fire with these other treatments. But we also use the other invertebrates as well. Many of you have probably heard about Pine Barrens Leps, and we have been working periodically between the New York State Museum entomologist and SUNY ESF looking at several rare Leps from inland barrens buck moths to a whole variety of nocturnal species. And we are seeing the distribution and abundance of those species. One, they're persisting, which is good. But two, we're rediscovering species that we thought were extirpated um, decades ago. Additionally, our, um, Amanda Dillon, um, our ecologist, is a, is a great entomologist. And she has been studying bees and wasps in the preserve and uh, other, other grad students as well, helping, helping us fill in gaps for some of these rare, rare species that we need to know something about. Another graduate student from SUNY Albany helped us understand um, the reptile and amphibian uh, distribution and abundance in Barron specifically. And much of the work that I, Amanda, and Steve do really relates to bird research. Birds, as you know, are pretty sensitive to landscape changes, to ecosystem changes. And many of the 43 of our, 43 of our SGCN species in the preserve are birds. So we do annual point counts and point counts help us, and these are permanent, so we've been doing this now for a while. And you can see the map there of all the point counts across the preserve along the trail system. I think there are 57 of them. And there we're simply getting abundance, um, ab abundance and distribution of species over time. And hopefully through that information, we will see the abundance and distribution of species like the prairie warbler, the eastern towhee, and brown thrashers, three of our SGCN birds, um, in increase and improve. And that is indeed happening. But point counts can only tell you so much. And we're really interested, particularly because this landscape is so fragmented, in the survival and productivity of these birds and thinking about source sink dynamics. If you know anything about grassland and forest birds, that's a real concern when it comes to habitat fragmentation. Thankfully, for young forest or, or early successional birds, it appears to be much less of an issue. And we have really abundant and growing populations of some of these species, like prairie warblers. And we know, we know about that through our point counts, but also by looking at our two band data from our two summer banding stations, where we can follow individuals over time and look at survival and productivity. And then we have a number of citizen science projects as well related to birds. This is our inventory, monitoring, and research list for 2017. The only point I want to make to you here is that it's long. We, uh, the staff, our citizen scientists, and academic partners are, have a lot of research and monitoring going on in the preserve, looking at birds. Um, microclimate, microclimatic differences in, along frost pockets and along the dunes, monitoring groundwater wells, lupin, carners, you name it. There's, there's a wide variety of, of things on here. And while any one of these may look like an interesting research project, ultimately they're all telling us about the health of the ecosystem as it relates to our management. That's our ultimate goal. 
and that leads us up to thinking about fuel and first order fire effects. So, and the reason I was particularly interested in working with um, the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange and Amanda and uh, to help host and, and uh, Jack McGowan Stinsky and Brian Stearns to host this, this, this workshop is that for all of the secondary fire effects and ecosystem level metrics that we have been monitoring over time, we have very little quantitative information, as in almost none, about fuels and first order fire effects. And one of the things that we're running into in particular as we're trying to publish a lot of some of, some of our research and monitoring is that we, we don't have really good information to point back to and say that was a hot fire, that was a cold fire, that was a, you know, we can tell seasonality. But I would like to be able to have more information that we can quantify and correlate with second order fire effects. So with, from June 6th through the 8th, we'll be here in the preserve and our laboratory will consist of a number of different sites across the preserve, from baseline restored pitch pine scrub oak barrens. We have uh, pitch forest canopy thinnings pre and post burn. We have growing season mow and burn sites. Um, when, I, when I put this slide show together uh, through 2016 in here, thinking we would use the sites from last year, and uh, Mr. Briggs has been busy. So we have several mow and burn sites now from 2017 that we, can, that we can use where the first order fire effects are a little more obvious and a little more prominent. And then we have, of course, untreated pitch pine scrub oak thickets. So I just wanted, wanted to take a second and show you some of, these, some of these sites. This is our untreated pitch pine scrub oak thicket. We call this management unit friendly because it is next to the New York State Thruway and we hope that if we name our units with, with nice names, they will be easier to burn in difficult juxtaposition with the landscape around us. We had one unit called Dreadful that we could never burn, so we changed its name to Delightful. Um, so this is kind of a typical, right? Everybody's seen this. If you've been in pitch pine scrub oak barrens in the Northeast, it's an overstory of pitch pine, few oak trees, some other, a few other overstory species in low numbers, but ultimately it's a thicket of scrub oak, huckleberry, and blueberry below it. This again, there's a dormant season picture of a, what we consider restored pitch pine scrub oak barrens. And again, you've got that open canopy above, you've got an open canopy at the shrub layer, and then an awful lot of grasses and wildflowers. And the idea being once we, so we're using a variety of tools, fire and mechanical whatnot, herbicides, in the restoration phase to get here. And now that we're here, we look at using a combination of growing season and dormant season fire, pretty frequent fire on the order of every five years. Um, so frequent, low intensity, low severity fires to maintain this condition. We don't have the luxury given our landscape of having the shifting mosaic that probably likely existed here when the preserve was, you know, 25, when the, land, when the pine bush before the preserve was about 25,000 acres in size. But we're looking at maintaining each of these, all of these serial stages across the landscape, uh, probably more, more permanently. Or we'll have some thicket and some, some true barrens. And here's an example of a 2016 mow and burn pitch pine scrub oak barrens. So that was taken immediately after we, we mowed that in the growing season and then burned it. And again, you can see, you can see, you know, look at the, the crown scorch and charring on the bark and those are the kinds of things that we hope to be looking at in, in the workshop, as well as litter and dust depth and, and so forth. Um, and then we have these thin sites, these forest canopies. This, again, was a closed canopy stand of pitch pine. And now it's, it's been thinned and prepped for burning. So that one uh, had not been burned, but you can see I'm standing in black in this picture. And that's what's behind me. Um, Tyler did burn one of these, uh, a 30 acre unit this spring. And that was a relatively mild fire, but it definitely met some objectives. So I look forward to getting into some of those sites as well um, with the workshop and learning with all of you about how, you know, what kind of tools exist, exist within, within the toolbox to be able to get some of these metrics so that as we look at, at long-term second order fire effects, we have some good information to be able to look back on. That, that quantifies and describes the, some of the immediate impacts and severity of some of these burns. So in conclusion, the, the, the Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission has been successfully using fire for about 24 years in this landscape. Our monitoring and adaptive management has increased the effectiveness of these fires, you know, shifting from dormant season fire to growing season mow and burn and using herbicides, silviculture, mowing, all of that. Um, and on, on whole, our broad ecosystem-wide ecological benefits, we, we're seeing broad system-wide ecological benefits, and we hope improved resiliency both to insect pests and pathogens like the southern pine beetle, but also hopefully um, buffering ourselves to some of the impacts of, of climate change. 
and uh, all of us, there are a number of us, myself and Tyler Briggs, of course, but also Steve and uh, Dylan are really looking forward to helping host this workshop and getting around the preserve with all of you, learning with you, and hopefully being able to share um, some, of what, some of what we've done in this really difficult landscape and uh, hope that it will benefit benefit what, what you may be looking to do back in your home units. And we really look forward to seeing you all then. Can't leave without acknowledgments. Um, the commission is funded by the New York State Environmental Protection Fund, which is a dedicated fund. And we receive that money through the New York, through a grant from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And much of our fire work, especially the, uh, the mechanical pretreatments for a lot of those growing season fires. We're really, um, thanks to the, the old National Fire Plan grants, and now the, the wild, we just received our first uh, WRR grant. And of course, I can't walk away without thanking the staff. Um, obviously, certainly Tyler Briggs, our fire manager and GIS specialist, but also our, preserve, our stewardship director, Joel Hecht, and Amanda and Steve, and our preserve steward, Jesse Hoffman. So with that, I am done. And I, I, again, I want to thank Amanda and you all for uh, attending the webinar today, and hope to see some of you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. And uh, don't worry, we have lots of time for questions. And I, I, see, I see a couple have popped up. Whoop, a few have popped up in the chat box already. So I'm going to do my best to uh, address these questions in the, in the order that they came in. Um, gosh, there's so much going on at the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. Um, it'll be, yeah, both ecologically and then all, with all the fire stuff. And then there's the whole monitoring angle. So let's see if we can uh, keep some of this of these questions uh, focused and answered <laughs> to everybody's satisfaction. So the first question that came in from Russ Hopping is, can you describe your nectar source monitoring? Nectar source monitoring, only as it relates to Connor Blues. So we, um, we have, well, as, as I'm a member of the state and federal recovery teams for the Connor Blue Butterfly, and we developed monitoring protocol for lupin, nectar, and structure that are directly associated with the goals established in the federal recovery plan for that species. So again, monitoring is, is question specific. So we have um, these nested plots and transects that we put out within Carner Habitat where we're counting lupin. And then there's a different, there's a different size plot for along those same transects for looking at nectar um, uh, species diversity is really all we're looking at. It's more of a richness measure not really um, a diversity index per se, don't get an abundance too much. We just want to know that we've got several nectar sources available for each brood of the carner. Then we have larger plots within this, within this nested, structural, ne nested monitoring design to look at the structural attributes of the habitat. So and I'll, I'll have that here, and actually I'm, I'm sure that's online through the federal, federal page, but um, yeah, our lupin nectar and structure monitoring protocol is definitely something I can send, um, share via the NAFSI website, or uh, or uh, um, you know, um, have it available if if, if uh, anybody's coming to the workshop in June. Sounds good. And Russ, feel free to, to email Neil. His email is on the uh, on the last slide there. Um, I'm going to fast forward to another Carner Blue question from Inga, and then we'll okay. come back to Bob's questions about fire. So, any speculation on why the Carner Blue population dropped in 2016? Yeah, there wasn't any habitat. Um, fire suppression. So loop, lupin is described in, in some of our, what we now have as high quality barrens. In those same sites in the 70s, it was described as lupin was scattered amongst the scrub oak up and over the dunes. It was blue with, you know, little clouds of, of blue flitting butterflies around. And really fire suppression um, resulted in that thicket condition. Lupin cannot exist in the shade of that thicket. Not, not, not many of those grasses and wildflowers can. And dormant season fire only exacerbated the issue because it stimulated sprouting and it stimulated acorn production. So it only made things worse. So between development fragmentation and fire suppression, we ended up with, with darn little, um, very little habitat on the landscape. And that's why we ended up with just a few hundred butterflies. Um, the, other, the other thing to think about with Connors is the whole fragmentation issue. The adult butterfly lives typically, what, five to seven days and doesn't travel more than a couple hundred meters from their natal patch of lupin, so getting them across this landscape with roads and development and in, in hospitable habitat just was really, really difficult. But ultimately, it was about habitat. So we simply, simply, not so simply, <laughs> created, created an awful lot of habitat on the landscape and ensured that there were adequate connections between those, those subpopulations and sites. And all of that detail is spelled out pretty well in, a, in the federal recovery plan. There's an appendix G with management guidelines in the back of that thing which is available at the Fish and Wildlife Services webpage. Got it. And just to clarify, that was 2016? 
Yeah, I think uh, he was no. asking about 2016. We were we were counting butterflies, but not generating population estimates in 2016. The federal recovery plan was finalized in 2003. Ah. Okay. Yep. Um, so, again, so again, you know, it took us like everything. It took us I, I, if, you, if maybe in an evening trip, some of us can go over and look at the former. Oh, why it dropped off last year? Yeah, I think I, think I, mis I misunderstood, and Steve just came Sorry. and stuck his head in the door. Um, <laughs> yeah, it dropped off last year because we had a terrible winter. Connor's overwinter ah. his eggs. And uh, there's, a, there's a really strong correlation between minimum snowpack and overwintering survival. And it's one of the, one of the wild cards of climate change. Um, the good thing was we had the population so high that despite that winter crash and, an, and, a, and a decline, a big decline between second brood of 2015 and first brood of 2016, we had still had enough butterflies in the landscape that the July brood of butterflies bumped right back up there to around 15,000. And keep in mind, too, those numbers on that graph are really conservative. They only relate to the area we physically sample, which is less than a third of the occupied lupin that we know we have in the, in the preserve. Wow. So Sorry, this, I misunderstood the question. Oh, no, no that's fine. But it's, it's all good information about the Connor Blues, which you've got plenty of information about. Um, I'm going to segue, uh, speaking of seasonality, we're going to segue to a couple of fire questions and comments from Bob Cremens. Um, so Bob asks, is it probable that growing season fires were the historical norm, the July-August thunderstorms as a source of ignition? Un unlikely in the east. And I actually, Steve, um, Steve Pine was here recently, and I've had this conversation with Dr. Patterson as well. And, and Bob probably knows, knows, in drought years, yes. So historically, the fire record here shows, and just thinking about historical um, weather and climate in the Northeast, growing season fires were probably not all that common, where relative to dormant season fires, particularly early in the spring when, you know, before things green up. But when we did get growing season fires, um, like, you know, 19, what does it have, 1919, 1947, there are some other years. We're typically in drought years, so you would get um, really severe um, growing season fires that would burn for, for quite a while and cover some good acreage and be difficult to put out. And we think that was the historic norm where you had relatively frequent low to moderate severity dormant season fires, but then those were punctuated by more extreme events, typically during drought years, where once you got an ignition, that, that, that ignition, that, that fire would then, you know, run, historically run the landscape until it either ran out of fuel or the weather rained and, and put it out. Uh -huh. Um, so another comment from Bob um, is, uh, we are building a super cheap fire effect monitor to hang on a tree or shrub to measure heat flux. Hope that one doesn't burn on Bob. <laughs> um, he says, <laughs> I will bring some by on the next fire I'm at on Albany Pine Bush. Um, Excellent. We would love to see him and love to, love to test that and, and use, use, that, use that, that equipment. Awesome. Um, again, I encourage folks to, uh, to type your questions into the chat box. Um, if there's time and if it's not too noisy on the phone line, we might open up the phone line um, at the end for, uh, for, for questions as well. Um, but for now, uh, please type questions into the chat box. Um, I see another question coming in from Inga. She's asking, are bad ozone days a major barrier for burning in Albany in the growing season? No, not specifically. Albany is, is not, let me make sure I phrase this correctly, Albany is not a non-attainment area. So we don't um, have a lot of concerns and and oversight as far, I mean, we have oversight, but not, not a lot, we don't have many concerns about um, air quality. But obviously, typically when we get those bad ozone days, those aren't days, you know, it's hot. And uh, typically we would be out of prescription anyway. So it, it, we have, we have, that has not been a, a big issue for us, Inga, but it may become one in the future. Got it. Uh, Tim Kirkpatrick has a question. Um, he says, is it possible to get your schematic for the monitor? I'm not sure what he's asking me. I don't know. Tim, would you mind clarifying your question in the chat box? Maybe, maybe for the transects? I'm not sure. We'll give Tim a moment to uh, clarify his question. And also, again, anybody else who's on, I'm sure there are... Oh, <laughs> Tim might be uh, typing, trying to type to Bob. Okay. Okay, right. I wondered about that. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, so that, that clarifies it. Um, great. So we'll let folks, uh, oh, here goes a question from Dr. Patterson. 
Um, he says, how will you ensure some pitch pine is a pitch pine scrub oak type when the current leaf trees inevitable sooner than later die? That's a great question. That's why we're looking at um, recruitment now and seeing what kind of recruitment we get with these various um, treatments, especially the growing season mow and burn treatment. And we're going to have to, uh, at some point, we're going to have to think about providing for recruitment events. So we may not now need an immediate recruitment event, but we need to know that we can create conditions favorable for recruitment so that if and when we get to a stage where the pitch pine trees are getting to an age where we have to worry about them senescing, um, that we can provide perhaps a longer fire interval to allow adequate pitch pine recruitment. We are seeing, oh, it's surprising to me because the dormancy season fires, we never saw pitch pine recruitment of any kind unless you were on a trail. But we are seeing really good pitch pine recruitment anecdotally in these mow and burn sites where we've exposed mineral soil. And uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, Steve Campbell has designed a, a pitch pine recruitment. And uh, it's almost a demography study that he designed where we're following individuals to see how they do. And it's a, you know, it's a classic uh, control, you know, before, before and after in a control back here. Um, sampling design where we have control sites where, that we've mowed and burned and now we're going to let those sit and see what we get for recruitment. We're also looking at, at recruitment insights for continuing to manage with fire and see how how those seedlings and saplings mature over time. But we, we are seeing some pretty decent recruitment. But worrying about recruitment, um, you know, you can't have a viable ecosystem if you're not able to, to ensure that your staple species are adequately recruiting into the system. So the, we, since we did not see that for a long time, we were really interested in monitoring the effects of these growing season fires, mow and burn fires, and seeing if we're actually stimulating conditions favorable for recruitment. And then we got to think about the next phase: how do we how do we manage conditions to ensure that those seedlings become saplings and pole size trees to inevitably replace the, pitch, the adult pitch pine? Thanks. Hopefully, that, hopefully that answered Dr. Patterson's question. <laughs> if not, he knows where to find you, and he'll be seeing you in he a sure couple does. of weeks. So, <laughs> all right. Um, we have a couple of more good questions that came in. First, Karen Caljo is asking, how many growing season burn days do you estimate per year? Boy, more than more than in the dormant season. Dormant season is tough around here. It's either too mm -hmm. too hot or too wet, or too dry or too wet, and there's only a couple of days in between. Um, Karen, we could look. Well, I, I could look into that to give you a more specific number. How, do, how many growing season burn days do we estimate per year? I, probably 15 to 20, potentially in prescription. And then you've got, you know, and then some of those are weekends. So we, we typically burn, what, six or eight days over the growing growing season and six or eight days over the course of the dormant season. And it's uh, the schedule, scheduling and getting everybody here and getting conditions and getting all those holes in the Swiss cheese to line up is really hard. It's not a lot, yeah. but we don't we don't need a lot, and particularly because in the growing season with these mo treatments, at least, it opens up the wet end of the prescription, and we so we can burn under higher humidities, and with lighter winds, and effectively when we run out of the mowing slash, the moisture of extinction puts the fire out. And in some cases where we were burning with near 60% RH, we could run the head fire directly into the unmowed fuels, and the fire would simply go out. Wow. Pretty cool to see. Learned about moisture of extinction in fire ecology in grad school, and it was nice to see that that actually works, or yeah. it can work. I wouldn't try that at home. Oh no, we could put in a little plug for the uh, the little YouTube video. Um, uh, uh, there's a YouTube video on the oh, yeah. NAFSI website. Yeah, go ahead. No, you do it. You, you know okay, well, yeah, there's a, there's a YouTube video on the NAFSI website of a prescribed fire uh, from August of 2016. Um, so you can just take a peek at what uh, live fire in the growing season looks like there. Um, actually, so Karen's question segues pretty well into this next one. So um, James is asking, what is the ideal growing season RH percent range to get the fire effect you were looking for? Uh, the ideal really depends on what we have for fuel on the ground before we burn. If it's a if it's a mode scrub oak thicket scenario. We're looking at humidities anywhere from in the upper 40s to pushing 60%. And we end up with really good, really good slow moving fires. Keep in mind that the vegetation is greened up through all that slash, which is why we can burn in those conditions. So the slash is carrying the fire, the, the live vegetation is slowing it down. So you end up with this long residence time and that opens up the wet end of the prescription. 
if we are in kind of a maintenance phase where some of those, um, the, or like the picture that's on the slide, the slide that's up now, you know, in there we don't have all that all that uh, fuel to mow. And if we wanted to go in here under the right conditions in the growing season, we would probably still be looking at humidities in the 30s, upper 30s to low 40s at most, I would think. Yeah. So it really depends on what fuel is carrying the fire. If it's the mowing slash, we can go wet. We can go on the wetter end of the prescription without the mowing slash. We're pushing the bottom of the prescription. And for us, our, our, the bottom of our RH for all of our prescriptions is 35%. Uh, um, so while we're giving folks another minute to uh, type questions into the chat box, this is your, this is your chance, folks. Um, I'll uh, ask sort of a summary and clarifying question, I think. Um, so you talked quite a bit about second order fire effects, which is uh, something that helps Albany Pine Bush really understand, you know, how much are you moving the needle to uh, yep. conserving this habitat? Um, so for, for first order fire effects, how would you describe what your objectives would be for establishing new uh, first order fire effects monitoring protocols? I'm, well, I'm most interested in, in, in indices of severity because I think severity more than intensity relates more to the second order of fire effects that we see in the vegetation and ultimately in the, in the rare wildlife. Um, and intensity, of course, is useful and related to severity, but, it's not, but they're, they're intensity and severity are different things. But uh, looking at you know, how severe those fires were, meaning how much, to, how much residence time might they have had, how much top kill or outright kill of varying, various species they might have had, did they, you know, did they make things like pitch pine? Was it severe enough that it made healthy pitch pine vulnerable to southern pine beetle or to, or to native bark beetles? Those kinds of things. But ah. sever severity ultimately, I think, is uh, what I'm most interested in. Great. Char height, scorch height, top kill, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Fuel consumption, litter and, litter, and duff, litter and duff exposure or reduction. Awesome. We'll be measuring lots of those. Um, yeah, I'm Good, because I don't know. What's, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to be we're going to be bringing out um, folks from the Lake States, of course, who have done a similar workshop uh, in their neck of the woods. Um, and a good focus of this workshop will be helping different participants in home units uh, figure out what metrics work for you and for achieving your management objectives. Um, I'll give folks another minute to type into the chat box. I think that we have time to open up the phone line. Um, so again, I'll give folks a little bit of time to type a question in the chat box, which is easy to address. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask if folks can, if you're able to mute your own phone line, um, please do that. And then when I unmute the participant line, uh, then we'll be able to, uh, to hopefully have a little bit of conversation. So if you have a question, um, then you can ask it. All right, so I don't see any more questions in the chat box. So we're going to give this a try. I'm going to unmute the phone line. Um, here we go. All right, the phone lines are unmuted. Does anybody on the line have a question for Neil that they'd like to, like to ask? <laughs> Crickets and background noise, but yeah. And, yeah, I know there were a couple folks that were just able to call in on the phone line. Anybody out there have a question? And that's perfectly fine. I, um, with a couple minutes we got left, I just wanted to reiterate what Amanda said about the workshop. And it's what the team has put together really is, is it's more of a cookbook. And the idea is to help folks understand what what tools are available to answer various questions. It's not that there's one specific way to do any of this monitoring, but what are the various tools that are available to try and answer the questions that folks may have back in your home units. I'm pretty excited about it. It's shaping up to be a, a pretty cool workshop. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I just want to put in a plug for, for Neil and for the Albany Pine Bush. Uh, we borrowed Neil for several presentations uh, <laughs> this year especially. Um, so if anybody is looking for resources related to communication about uh, fire, about prescribed fire, about growing season burns, about wildlife monitoring, um, about a whole bunch of different things. Uh, Neil has been very generous with his time in sharing the lessons learned and also the questions that the Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission has um, about you know, managing these habitats using fire. 
Um, so coming to the workshop is a great way to see firsthand what it looks like, what the challenges are, and how uh, Albany Pine Bush uh, is able to address them. Um, but I, I imagine Neil is very happy to be reached out to at any time. Um, if you have questions about anything from birds, the left, the bugs, the butterflies, um, and fire, um, then Neil is very happy to answer those questions. Um, we actually might be able to wind up the webinar a minute early or so, but let's see. Um, anybody is welcome to type into the chat box or I'll stop talking and give folks time to ask a question if you have one. And my email's there, so I'm just I'm just one of you know twenty some odd staff here. So if you have a question about anything else related to our work, education, interpretation, any of that stuff, there are folks here that might be better able to answer it than me. But I'd be happy to to ferret any questions or comments that people have. You can just simply email me. Great, thank you. On time and under budget. <laughs> That's how we roll, right? <laughs> okay. Well, I guess with that, um, we will conclude this webinar. Uh, Neil, like, thanks, thanks again so much for your time. Um, and everybody, if you have questions for Neil, feel free to reach out. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing folks at the workshop. Thanks and take care. Thanks, Amanda. See you then. Bye. All right. Bye.